All right. Today we have a video on the World War II German self-loading rifle series, specifically the Walther G41 and G or K43. In my hands is a G41W. Actually, this is just a G41. It was manufactured during the standard production run of these, not experimental, so the W was dropped. This example here was manufactured by uh, Berlin Louis, which is a BLM or code DUV. This is a DUV 43. The, uh, the G41 was really the first production self loading rifle that Germany adopted. In World War I, they didn't really have much of anything. They had some submachine guns. They were one of the earlier countries to, to go to a submachine gun. But even in the you know, 20s and 30s, people in Germany had considered a self-loading rifle, but they decided not to go for it. They didn't want to waste ammunition. They thought accuracy would suffer. They thought troops would uh, you know, lose the magazines or they were detachable. Just the usual complaints that people had back in that era about um, about self-loading rifles. So the idea got shelved and uh, when Nazi Germany went to war in 1939 the uh, the K-98 Mauser, the same Mauser that basically been serving Germany for uh, oh 40 years at that point had um, was their standard issue. Well after Operation Barbarossa when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union in 1941 June they, they saw the, uh, the value in a self-loading rifle because of the SVT-40 Tokarev, well, SVT-38 and SVT-40 Tokarev rifles. In a lot of ways, it seems like the Germans are more impressed with the Tokarev rifle than the, the Soviet Russians had been. Anyway, so they looked at that, and then they, they kind of decided to go ahead and re-up the, uh, the efforts towards a self-loading rifle, and that's where the G-41 came from. They had a lot of strange requirements for these. They didn't want a hole in the barrel, so it needed to be a self-loading rifle, but without a, a, a hole in the barrel for gas to pour it through. It had to be able to operate like the K-98, so it could be a semi-auto or a self-loading uh, single shot. And they didn't want any moving external parts. Well, Mauser met all of these requirements. He came up with the G-41M. And it was a horribly complicated, horribly unreliable thing. Walther basically said nuts to that. And while they didn't do a port in the barrel for the gas system, their G41W for Walther does have, as you see, external moving parts. And it does not function like a Mauser. Yes, you could single shot it, you know, by manually cocking it. But it doesn't operate like a Mauser. So Walther just basically ignored a good bit of the military requirements and ended up making a superior weapon. It was both easier and faster to mass produce, and it was also more reliable. We'll get to that in a second as far as reliability. So the, uh, the G41W was selected for adoption and further development, and the G41M, uh, basically that was it. In 1942, these designs came out, the decision was made, uh, Mauser had already been contracted to produce between seven and 15,000 G41Ms, and this contract was actually fulfilled as late as spring of 43 because it was a military contract. But um, now the G41W was what was going to go ahead. Two factories were going to build it, Carl Walther, code AC, and Berlin, Berlin Louis, code DUV. Now most of these G41s were produced by BLM because Walther throughout 1943 was still refining the design and would come up with, with this gun's successor. This was a standard issue gun, hence why it is just marked um, G41, not G41W. And they produced between, according to some sources, 40,000 to 145,000. Obviously, 40,000 seems a bit low based on observed serials. Looking at serials and, you know, current modern data, it seems like between 115 and 125,000 of these were made 
between late 1942 and uh, late 1943. So they didn't produce them in quite large numbers. Most were sent to the Eastern Front in Russia and were lost or captured. Quite a few were actually at the beaches on Normandy and U.S. soldiers and British soldiers and Canadian soldiers went up against the G-41 in Normandy. So I did see you know, pretty extensive combat in uh, early to mid-1944. So how did Walther get around not having a hole in the barrel? Well, they used the bang or gas trap system. There's this cone up here, and it's actually very easy to unscrew. You just press this plunger down and it unscrews off. I'm not going to do it on camera, but and then this whole front piece removes. There is a cylindrical piston. The gas is captured up here in the cone. Then it puts pressure on a piston, which has an arm, which pushes back on this uh, bolt carrier back here comes out up here. So that, that's what cycles the action. The G41 fed from a fixed 10 round magazine. It does remove but only for cleaning. It's not removable normally. Has a machined dust cover here. Has a safety, a wing style safety, kind of Mauser style here. This one's very stiff. Some were fitted with scope mounts here that kind of straddled the uh, receiver. This one does not have it. Just a regular machined receiver here. These receivers were actually forged. Got a machined dust cover. Has a Mauser style bayonet lug here. Mauser style cleaning rod. Full length stocked as you can see. This one here has the synthetic handguard which was a Durafall was the brand name. It's uh, more of a phenolic resin than it is Bakelite. It's full length handguard up here. Pretty standard Mauser, adjustable rear sights. Got your uh, charging handle on the right. This is your takedown catch here. To take the gun apart, you pull it back, flip it over, lock it, lock to the carrier and then you can press this takedown button and release it but I'm not going to do it again on camera. It uses a bolt with two flaps that come out, one forward. This thing's going to be stubborn on me now. There we go. Without being able to take the mag out, you've got to manually do it. And it was topped off by stripper clips. But yeah, it's a unique design and it was more reliable than the G41M but this whole bang or gas trap system was overly complicated. This gun is quite front heavy and it is quite long as you can see. It's uh, definitely a full length rifle. But this was the first that Germany adopted. Soldiers did like having an automatic, but they did not like having to top it off with a stripper clip and they did not like that it required very, very regular cleaning. Yeah, it takes a standard Mauser type sling. You can see a slot in the stock here. Same type of sling mount in the front. This is a relatively middle production BLM. It is not completely matching, but it always has correct parts with blue finish and all that. Most everything is a machined or forged on it. Very few stampings on these early G41s. I personally probably wouldn't shoot it just because Replacement parts for these are extremely hard to come by, and again, they are kind of a fiddly gun to get them working reliably. But um, yeah, this was the first uh, self-loading rifle to go into standard production, standard service in uh, in Germany. Well, we will move on. So we just looked at the G41. This is a G43. This is an AC44. It's an early production one from the A block, so it would have been made in, in early 1944, just a few months after production began on these. It was manufactured at the Walther factory. Now, the G43 still fired the same 8mm Mauser cartridge as the G41. The bolt system is very much the same. The bolts are not interchangeable because these are dimensionally different, but still the same system with the flaps that come out. The G43 
charging handle has been moved to the left side. The take down latch is a different style now. It's on the right. It actually hinges this way as it pivots that way as opposed to flicking like a toggle. So that's the same. Pretty much everything else is different. <laughs> These are still built on forged receivers and several different types were used. We'll get into those in a minute. This one here is what was just a standard rough forged receiver from Walther. It does have the scope rail on the right side here. This one, because it's an earlier production, still has the G41 style machine top cover with automatic dust cover here. Laminated wood stock. Has a wood hand guard. The main difference between the 41 and the 43 is they abandoned the gas trap system and they went to a SVT-40 style short stroke gas piston system which is under the handguard here. Much more reliable, easy to produce. The only thing I would say is it's a little more difficult and just a little bit more to get to for cleaning, but that's, that's minor. The four stock was also cut back as you can see. The bayonet feature was deleted. Uses a hooded front sight. This has a threaded muzzle for attaching a blank firing device. You press in here and then it just unscrews. Little cap there. Uses its own style of uh, protector. Still takes a Mauser type sling. Another major difference is the G43 now feeds from detachable 10 round box magazines. There's several variations of these mags exist. Some are blued like this one, some are painted, some are even phosphated. This is a relatively early mag that's blued. Same style of rear sights. Same type of safety back here. They did add this trap door in the butt stock. So if I can grab with my fingers or not. Stiff, so I'm not even going to try. You see it's ridged there. It holds an oiler, some spare parts, cleaning patches, etc. The G41 had just a solid buttstock. But yeah, this is an early G43 produced in the, probably the first month or so, maybe the second month of 1944. G43s were produced by total of three factories. Walther, who had been working on the design since 1943 and perfected it and went into production in, in October of 1943. Louis Berlin switched over in early 44 and Gustav or Guslov work started in 44 but only produced about 50,000 because they were bombed by the Allies in August so the, those are the rarest. Um, Walther, as I said, used AC Louis Berlin used DUV originally, and then they went to QVE in 1945, and Gustav used BCD. Again, they, they only produced about 50,000, so not, not many of those out there. The majority you're going to see are going to be BLM or Walter. Walther was always tinkering with the design, and we'll show you a, a late war here in just a minute. So the, the Walther guns tend to change the most. The Louis Berlins stayed basically the same. They had a lot of blue parts and so on and so forth. We, ha we have a blog article for all those kind of details if you're interested in the nuts and bolts. But And the, uh, the Gustav ones pretty much stayed the same because of the short production run. Most of the, the K-43s or the G-43s were not ready by the time of D-Day. So most of these guns that they were used against the Allies were used in the Battle of the Bulge and afterwards. Several also were sent over to the Eastern Front and used in Soviet Russia. It was more reliable than the G-41, but it had an issue of being overgassed, and it still wasn't as reliable as, say, the M1 Grand or even the, the Russian Tokarev. So, you know, the, the problem was Germany left it too late for 
making its self-loading rifle. So they, they suffered because of it. They were lagging behind. This is a good gun, but it's more of an interesting gun than an actual battle-proven gun. They, they had several shortcomings, and um, they really just didn't have time to work these out. Trigger is pretty okay, but it just kind of hangs here. Yeah, this is one of the first G43, still marked as such, G43. Made by Carl Walter. But we'll move on. And for our final rifle, we have a K43. This one here was produced at Walther in 1945. It is marked AC45, and its serial is in the C block, so it's quite late. There are definitely examples in the D block, and some people have reported examples in the E block as well. But once you get that late, they tend to be guns that weren't quite completed by the end of the war. Anyway, this is a late one, and Really, the only difference between a G43 and a K43 is a, no, is a name change. They, it was a propaganda thing. The order went down to change the name from Gewehr 43 to Carabiner 43 in April of 1944. However, it took quite a bit of time to switch over. The, you, you start to see the first K43s appearing out of BLM and Walther in the, the latter part of 1944. However, and this especially goes for Walther. Older, previously rejected receivers will pop up in 1945, still marked G43. So, it, again, it was just a propaganda thing, kind of like the MP44 being changed to STG44. STG it was just a, a name change. So this being a late war gun, it was basically simplified for mass production. And it was also, they, they did institute some changes to try to improve reliability and accuracy and whatnot. Starting at the muzzle, it is no longer threaded. Also, the step down in front of the sight base was deleted, so they didn't have to machine the barrel, made it a little faster. On the previous one, there was um, ridging here, stepped into the back of the front sight to kind of cut down on glare. That's gone now. Cleaning rods are basically the same. This is basically the same here. Your furniture has doesn't really change. Some, most of your Walters are going to have laminated furniture. Some from 1945 were fitted with hardwood walnut. They, people speculate that the supplier of the laminate furniture couldn't get the, the parts over to Walther. This one here still has a rough cast receiver. This is a what is called a dual guide lug. It's got a second lug here. No one knows exactly why they left these on, but people speculate maybe they're trying to stabilize the bolt and give better, um, better accuracy. Either way, it did facilitate a change in the bolt where they had to move the extractor to accommodate the lug. Still feeds from a 10 round detachable mag. This is a later production mag that has a third reinforcing rib on the bottom here. Just something they added to try to make it better. This one also has an updated gas cylinder under the handguard that actually has some vent ports in it to try to let off excess gas pressure and keep the rifle from uh, beating itself to death from being overgassed. It was only modestly successful. These still, can, still are overgassed. The automatic dust cover from the previous one is replaced with a manual dust cover. It just has a little tab you just pull back and forth. When they went to these stamped uh, top covers here, the first one still had an automatic cover, but it kept binding. It just wasn't a very effective thing, so they ended up not putting the tail on that hooked to the bolt carrier. And then they put a little tail on the back of this where you can manually flick it forward and back. Another major change towards the end of the war, and this is only done at the Walther factory, is the takedown catch has been deleted. It's just solid here. You can still take these apart, but 
I promise you they're not near as easy to do without the takedown catch. I, I have done it and um, it, I, the other one is uh, 10 times faster. Some other little production changes. If you noticed on the AC44 you just looked at, this bolt knob was solid, now it's hollow. I don't know why they exactly did it. It saves a little weight. Maybe it's probably easier to produce that way. Also, this butt trap here is smooth now. They, they quit doing the ribbing. These Both of these changes happened in mid-44, as did deleting the, uh, the threaded muzzle. The dual guide lug, though, was a 1945 feature. The missing takedown lever was started in late 1944. And not all of these changes were implemented on all guns. Well, Walther produced K-43s up until the Allies captured the factory in April of 45. BLM continued just a little bit later until the first day or two of May. Yeah, actually, a lot of the parts were shipped from the Walther factory when it was clear that it was about to be captured. And BLM would, um, would use these to produce guns. The Walther code would remain AC. Like I said, the BLM code would uh, go from... Uh, DUV to QVE. Just little things, you know, nerding out on collecting circles. But yeah, they were, they were still, Walther, to their credit, was uh, still tinkering with the design, trying to make it more reliable, even at the end when it was clear the war was over. But that was pretty much it. Um, over 420,000 of these were produced, so not a huge number, still shy of even half a million. The truth of the matter is, the gun came too late in the war to make much of a difference. And it was just, it was behind other self loading rifles of the day. Also, just a few months after this critter came out, we're not even really a few months, and we're already pretty much exactly the same time, the uh, MP44 came out. The, the, considered by many the first uh, assault rifle, that's debatable, but you know, most people consider that, and that was pretty much outclassing this gun. It was cheaper and faster to mass produce, held more cartridges, was more reliable. Really the only areas where the, um, where the GK-43 outclassed the MP-44 were in range and uh, power. You know, the 8mm Mauser cartridge was still more powerful than 8mm Kurs. But aside from that, the, this gun was pretty much already being made obsolete. After the war, some K-43s remained in German service, especially in East Germany. You see a lot of East German reworks. Also, Czechoslovakia adopted it until it made its own rifles, but it was used in, the, in Czechoslovakia for a time in the late 40s and early 50s. Other than that, though, that was pretty much it. It ended up just more or less being a technological dead end. So. You know, unlike certain other guns that progressed from World War II, this was something that um, just never really went too much of anywhere. It did give Germany a self-loading rifle during the war, but it just was there. Still yet, from a collecting standpoint, these things are fascinating. They um, have a lot of small variations, and it's amazing for only being in production 18 months how many variations there are of the GK-43. But I've always liked Walther's, so I wanted to share these. Again, for more detailed information and exact numbers and whatnot, please check out our blog article on this rifle. And if you have any questions or comments, please post them below. Well, this is Misha, and uh, thanks for tuning in.